This is episode 9 of the Wrong Fun Podcast, dedicated to all things science fiction and fantasy. Welcome aboard. We've a long voyage ahead, so we've lined up the best entertainment money can buy. Let's welcome our hosts, hailing from Oaks Colony, Sean, and from Broncoville Mining Colony, Allie. So sit down, strap in, and hold on while the captain fires the thrusters to maneuver the ship away from the station. Humans need such a narrow range of temperatures and pressures. It's remarkable that fatal environmental failures happen as rarely as they do. Welcome back to the Wrong Fun Podcast. You're a wrong fan and you're having wrong fun. I'm Sean. And I'm Allie. And together we're going to take you on a rocket ride in the science fiction and fantasy universe. So, Allie, I understand you went to something very interesting this week. I got to see Kevin Smith. Ooh. So, what was that like? It was oddly inspiring. (laughs) (laughs) Usually his shows are just funny, but he was actually kind of inspiring this week. (laughs) So, what did he talk about? Uh, He talked a lot about podcasts, and he encouraged everybody to go out and record a podcast. (laughs) So that was kind of cool. And uh, he told everybody to go out and chase your whimsy, whether it be recording a podcast or making a film or pretty much anything. Anything that floats your boat, go out and do it. It was really cool. It was lots of fun. He was going to go watch Star Wars out in Colorado here. So it was a it was a really cool show. Excellent. I've wanted yeah. to see him on stage. I, I've, I've seen some of the stuff that he's done on stage, and it, he seems very interesting. It was amazing. Cool. So next episode's book, If Then, by Matthew DeBachua, and I hope I'm not butchering the poor man's name. I did hear him on Adventures in Sci-Fi Publishing, and that is how they said his name. So If Then, Matthew DeBachua, $3 for the Kindle version on Amazon. James has a scar in the back of his head. It's where he was wounded in the Battle of Suvla Bay in August of 1915. Where is the scar the mark of his implant that allows the process to fill his mind with its own reality? In If, the people of a small English town cling on after everything fell apart under the protection of the process, the computer system that runs every aspect of their lives. But sometimes people must be evicted from the town, and that's the job of James the bailiff. While on patrol, James discovers the replica of a soldier from the First World War wandering the South Downs. This strange meeting begins a new cycle of evictions in the town. While out on the rolling downland, the process is methodically growing the soldiers and building the weapons required to relive a long lost battle. In Then, it is August 1915 at the Battle of Suvla Bay in the Dardanelles campaign. Compared to the thousands of allied soldiers landing on this foreign beach, The men of the 32nd Field Ambulance are misfits and cranks of every stripe. A Quaker pacifist, a free-thinking padre, a meteorologist, and the private, once a bailiff, known simply as James. Exposed to constant shell fire and haunted by ghostly snipers, the stretcher bearers work day and night on the long carry of wounded men. One night, they stumble across an ancient necropolis, disturbed by an exploding shell. What they discover within this ancient site will make them question the reality of the war and shake their understanding of what it means to be human. Sounds interesting. It does, and I listened to the discussion on Adventures in Sci-Fi Publishing, and I thought, oh, this does sound like a very interesting book, so I thought we'd give it a shot. And at three bucks, hey, definitely a good price. Can't beat it. All right. Sean, you have an incoming call on the Ansible. It's our guest, Brad Torgerson. Computer. What do your databanks have on Brad Torgerson? Brad R. Torgerson is a healthcare tech geek by day, a chief warrant officer in the U.S. Army Reserve on weekends, and a science fiction writer by night. He was the 2012 triple nominee for the Campbell, Hugo, and Nebula Awards, and has won the Association of Mormon Letters Award for Best Short Fiction and a Writers of the Future Award. He is also a three-time winner of the Analog Magazine and Lab Reader's Choice Award. His most recent novel, The Chaplain's War, was published in trade paperback in September of 2014 and is now out in mass market paperback for 2016. Patch him through. I knew Sean was going to say that. He's so predictable. 
I could easily write a subroutine to replace him. No one would notice the difference. Welcome to the show, Brad. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Before we get started on any Sad Puppies questions, I just wanted to tell you that I really liked your novel, The Chaplain's War. You did a special early this year where the Audible version was really super cheap, so I picked up an audiobook version, and the doctor gave me some of these new medications that made me really tired. So I listened to your book, and it really made the difference in keeping me awake and entertained and focused while I was driving, and plus it was a really awesome story, so <laughs> thanks a lot. You're welcome. I'm glad to know it uh, it, it did its job. Uh, Larry <laughs> Niven, uh, one of his laws for writing is uh, it's a sin to waste the reader's time. So I, I try to abide that when I when I sit down and do a story or a book. So I'm glad it worked. Oh, yes. It was a wonderful, wonderful story and never really went where I expected it to go. I, uh, I've had uh, a number of people uh, ask me if I'm doing a sequel. And I, I did not plan one when I did the book. It was intended to be a standalone. Well, really, I, I built it from two previous uh, pieces of short fiction that were connected and published in analog. And even those, I had not intended to do uh, something after. Uh, so the project just keeps finding new life. Um, I, I am contemplating doing a sequel. I've got some ideas I'm bouncing around. So we'll see where that goes. But yeah, meanwhile, I'm, I'm very pleased with how well the book's done with people. I've gotten lots and lots of nice letters. The reviews are generally really, really positive. And yeah, people tend to uh, uh, mirror your comments. Uh, they say that it was unexpected where it went. It was very different for the kind of story it was, uh, you know, pretty much uh, aliens versus uh, futuristic military. That's that's a very time-honored uh, traditional storyline. But a lot of people have said they liked uh, the things that I did with it that were very different, especially in terms of, you know, how the humans and the aliens interact and so on and so forth. So again, I, I try to abide uh, Larry Niven's advice. <laughs> Don't waste the reader's time. Well, you certainly didn't waste any of my time. I was very glad that I spent the time with it. So thank you very much. No problem. Brad, you led the Sad Puppies 3 campaign. How did that come about? Uh, the short answer is that, uh, you know, Larry Korea had done um, the two previous iterations, mostly as a lark. Uh, he was mostly uh, just kind of uh, poking fun at some sacred cows, uh, kind of, you know, uh, the emperor has no clothes, so to speak. And with Sad Puppies, uh, I think originally uh, Sarah Hoyt was going to take it, and then she, 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 you know, life happened. Uh, so Sarah got derailed off of that, and we were kind of talking, well, should we even bother doing it? And you know, has it run its course? And and I jumped in and said, no, you know, you know what? Let's let's you know, let's do it again, and I'll I'll take it this time. Not really <laughs> comprehending, obviously, the the furor that was going to result from it. But at the time, back in I think it was January. We thought, hey, yeah, let's let's do it again. You know, each iteration had attracted more and more interest, and we'd gotten more and more support from different uh, segments of, of the readership and different fans from uh, around the country and around the world, really. And so we said, yeah, heck, why not? Let's go for it. And and you know, Larry at that point was he really didn't want to have to carry the flag. And I was also of a state of mind where I was like, I, I don't want Larry to have to do this all by himself. You know, I think he's doing a worthy thing. But he shouldn't do it all by himself, and so I, I said, okay, I'll, I'll carry the flag this year, and we'll, we'll see what we can do with it. So, what were the main differences between Sad Puppies Three and the previous Sad Puppies campaigns? Well, I, I think uh, with uh, one and two, again, this was kind of a lark. Larry was being very tongue in cheek uh, with it, and especially with number two, I, I think everybody was a little bit surprised at the results that came out of it, and so we kind of put our heads together and, and uh, decided to get a little more ambitious with three. Uh, in terms of you know how much we were going to nominate and who, but r really for me, um, because I was the guy carrying the flag, I said, well, you know what, I, I don't want to make this just a, a bunch of us, you know, poking our thumb in somebody's eye, which is kind of what one and two had been. I mean, we had been obviously lambasting a certain segment of the uh, science fiction establishment, uh, a very uh, specifically politically liberal establishment, and. Uh, but this time around, I, I didn't want to pay much, as much attention to that aspect of it as much as I, I thought, well, you know, what we should be doing is really trying to get some works and some authors and some editors and some artists, you know, people that I thought were really doing quality stuff. Um, and some of them had been doing quality stuff for many years, you know, and for some reason, they just were never on the Hugo radar. And those reasons weren't obvious to me when I got into this business uh, way back in uh, 2009, but by 2015, they had become plainly obvious. 
you know, you go to the convention and you talk to enough people, you you find out it's it's the usual song and dance. You know, it's who you know, it's who you schmooze. Uh, you know, how many friends can you have? Do you have the right friends? Uh, you know, once once that curtain is pulled back, you, you can't you can't unsee it. <laughs> so I, I you know my 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 disillusionment was kind of total. But I thought you know what if we're if we're going to do this, we're gonna we're gonna try to get some recognition um, for some people that have been laboring long and hard, uh, and even some newcomers that I thought you know deserved some attention. Uh, and I, I I really wasn't interested in making it a political thing per se, not in the extent that yeah we're gonna we're gonna select strictly from one side of the political aisle because that was the other thing that annoyed me about the Hugos was that it was it was t to me anyway and I think to a lot of other people it was plainly obvious that they were extremely politically slanted uh, it was enormously difficult for uh, uh, any author uh, who uh, was right of center to get any kind of traction uh, this was an award pretty much kind of a, a liberals only award uh, and so I thought, you know, let's let, let's make Sad Puppies three, you know, truly cosmopolitan in its content. Uh, we, we won't care about ideology so much. We'll make it more about uh, the work, and we'll, we'll we'll cast a wide net, which is kind of what we did. And uh, I think that was the chief difference: is that we cast a wide net, and 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 we made it kind of a broad spectrum thing, um, and and really and really invited lots of people to participate. I think that was the other part of it: is that we. Uh, we really just said, hey, gang, you know, to the universe, hey, gang, you know, here's this thing. You can participate in it if you're a fan. Maybe you didn't know you could participate uh, before, but you can now. Uh, you know, there's no there's no law against it. You just have to, you know, uh, pay your toll fee, uh, your, your ticket price, and, and you can nominate and you can vote. And so we, we did this call to action, basically. And um, uh, I want to emphasize, uh, you know, again, all of this... Uh, it was important to me that all of this was done out in the open, because that was that was one of the things that annoyed me the most about uh, going to Worldcon and, and again going to the room parties and going to the Sifa Suite and listening to all the old timers talk about all the shenanigans that everybody had been pulling and had pulled over the years. And it was all you know behind closed doors. You know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And I, uh, to me, that was uh, not only was that uh, uh, disillusioning, but it was also offensive because. You know, in theory, the award is supposed to be about the quality of the work, not who you know and how many backs you can scratch. But it was plainly obvious that that was a big part of it. So I thought, no, I don't want Sad Puppies Three to be a uh, an invisible thing going on behind the behind the scenes. I thought, let's do this out in the open where everybody can see it. Uh, you know, it's we're not gonna we're not gonna make it clandestine like so many of the other quiet operations have been and continue to be. You know, they don't end. In fact, uh, I, I fully expect those clandestine operations to be more vigorous and, <laughs> and more pointed than ever before. Uh, now that they know there's competition, you know, that's the thing. Uh, I think uh, from the outside looking in, probably one of the chief differences with Sad Puppies Three is that with one and two, yeah, it was it was a, it was a lark, and um, it didn't really upset people because it hadn't really challenged the establishment, like um, like really challenged the establishment. Sad Puppies Three was a was pretty much a white glove across the face uh, to the establishment, and and of course they they responded with uh, both barrels, and we'll get into that I'm sure as we <laughs> talk about this. So how did you choose the list of nominees? It was it was a scatter shot. Um, I didn't really have like a singular funnel. It was mostly just uh, I put the call out on my blog. Uh, I, I I was getting messages through email, getting messages through Facebook. Uh, you know it was it was this this kind of uh, sprinkler system of suggestions and and uh, we should do this person or we should do this story or that story or this book or that book. So I, I put together a, a, a spreadsheet uh, that ended up containing many dozens of, of names and suggested stories and books and so on and so forth um, for the various categories. And uh, anytime any one of those uh, names or books or stories or whatever it happened to be for the category um, popped up more than once, you know, it kind of nudged it uh, to the top. So really, we we had many, many dozens of uh, of suggestions, and then what coalesced out of that were the ones that had multiple uh, hits on them, meaning uh, three or four or more people had suggested the same book or the same story, uh, and and so that's what I ended up putting onto the the final suggestion list uh, that went live on the blog. That was one thing we talked about was, uh, you know, do we want to just do one suggestion in each category and then 
you know, we kind of thought, well, no, then you know, we'll just we'll kind of blow it open. We'll 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 put a bunch of suggestions on there because, honest to goodness, we uh, we didn't expect more than one or two per category to get through. Uh, we were surprised about how successful number two had been in that regard, but we didn't think uh, then. This is like back in January. Uh, we didn't think then that uh, we would sweep uh, the categories to the extent that we did. I, I know a lot of the uh, establishment people. Uh, that, that's one of their chief uh, hobby horses. Is they they rail on and on about how unfair it was that sad puppies uh, uh, took over some of the categories. And you know, for me, I'm like, ah, eh, well, okay. I, you know, I guess I can see that to a certain extent, but. <laughs> at the same time, it was hilarious to us because uh, we all looked at each other and went, "Holy crap! Look how easy it was to to get a, you know even a few people motivated to vote." It really surprised us how many of the suggestions made it onto the final ballot. And of course, the, the, you know, all hell broke loose once the final ballot was released. That's that's really when things just went hog wild in terms of social media and and all the broader media started to get involved. The three criticisms most often leveled at Sad Puppies 3 were that nominations were self-serving, they were anti-diversity, and the writing was of poor quality. Were any of these even remotely valid? Uh, you know, people who say they were self-serving, I, I laugh at that one. And the reason I laugh at that one is because if you go back and look at prior years, most of the nominations are all self-serving. Um, everybody's friends vote for everybody's friends. Certain people with a very active social media footprints or very large social media footprints uh, tend to get lots of uh, get lots of attention um, you know so uh, so when they they come at us and say it was so self-serving I say okay so that's different from any other year how I consider that to, to be a pot calling the kettle black so I don't pay attention to that one to the same degree I don't pay attention to the anti-diversity uh, accus accusation that to me is another red herring I'm really not sure what they were expecting or what they thought. I mean, to me, it's funny because if we're talking diversity, what does that mean? It means different things to different people. Uh, to the people who call this anti-diversity, it means they want the ballot to be composed of people who all think the same, vote the same, have the same general ideology, and spout the same opinions. Our final suggestion list was actually pretty diverse if you look at it from a standpoint of who the people were, who the artists were, what the works were. Uh, that's another thing. Um, uh, you know, again, it was a wide net, and because I was kind of the the show driver, I I, I deliberately made sure it was a wide net. I didn't want it to be, uh, you know, the same thing every single time down the list, which of course didn't matter to the people who were upset at us. Uh, <laughs> you know, they were they they were bound to determine to to freak at us no matter what and call us names, and they did. Um, but really, you know, from a diversity standpoint, I thought ours was was more than adequate and in fact was way more diverse uh, again from an ideological standpoint than a lot of uh, final ballots that we've seen in recent years um, where most if not all at least in the writing categories and in the editorial categories most if not all of the names on there tend to be very same minded you know and, and it's and it's not it's not secret knowledge you can go read people's blogs you can go read their opinions that they uh, they post all over the internet and it, it's pretty self evident after a while that it, it, it it's all from the same general ideological pool, whereas I thought ours was a, a little bit more representative of 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 a, of a true uh, spectrum, so to speak, if I can use that word. And then of course the poor writing quality. Uh, that one, you know, if you're if you're if you're a snob, yeah, yeah, we had poor stuff on there, and and I don't apologize to the snobs. Um, the, the snobs I think can go to hell. Well, the snobs have always been with us, and and you know the snobs to me are like hipsters. Uh, the more popular something it is, uh, the more they're going to bag on it. Um, and th that's almost always the case. You know, if something is popular, uh, they'll accuse it of being terrible writing um, for simply no other reason than that it's popular. Uh, frankly, I thought all the work that wound up on the uh, on the suggestion list was was perfectly good stuff. I thought it was all really good, in my opinion. But was it all to my taste? No, of course it wasn't. But the, there again. I think the snobs uh, fall down uh, on the job because they don't, in my opinion, they don't know how to differentiate between something that is to their taste and something that is objectively good. Because really, honest to goodness, and I've, I've had this conversation before with people, th there is no such thing as objectively good. Uh, there are things that stand the test of time, uh, like, you know, the Lord of the Rings books or... Um, I think actually uh, probably uh, J.K. Rowling's uh, Harry Potter series 
stands a good chance of becoming uh, our generation's uh, iteration of Lord of the Rings. I think it's going to be read long after J.K. Rowling is dead. I actually think uh, Orson Scott Card is going to be read long after he's dead. You know, there are things that sur survive the test of time uh, that people generally acknowledge as being good or even great. Uh, but you know, it's all about taste. And you know, to be honest, I struggle when I read uh, Tolkien because I think the language is cozy. Um, I think he definitely wasn't a plotter uh, to modern standards. You know, he, he's much more of a world builder, and he, and it's the world building that I think is, is a large part of the reason why that series has been so uh, cemented in our popular imagination. Especially after the movies came out, you know, everyone loved the movies, and I, I did too. I thought they were fantastic. I like, I liked the the Lord of the Rings movies much more than the books. Truth be told, uh, but that's another topic for another podcast. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, poor writing quality, and eh, that's subjective. Um, again, the snobs, snobs will you know do what they do. Uh, they're a dime a dozen, and you know, most often they're frustrated writers in and of themselves who uh, tend to wish that they uh, got more prestige than they do. Uh, you know, for me, it's just like, whatever, you know, was it published? Hey, it was published. Apparently somebody likes it. Uh, in certain cases, somebody likes some of this stuff a lot. I mean, Jim Butcher uh, has uh, tons of fans. Uh, Larry Korea has tons of fans. Uh, you know, these are, these are uh, authors who are uh, reaching a very wide audience. And you, you, in my opinion, past a certain point, uh, quantity, uh, has a quality all its own uh, and so when you, have, when you have somebody who is reaching an audience of, of such a, a immense proportion as somebody like Jim Butcher uh, you know it's like okay maybe you don't like Jim's work maybe you're not into it that's fine you just have to say it's not to my taste but clearly it's to somebody's taste and you know uh, you know probably that's going to remain true for uh, the rest of Jim's career uh, and I don't see that changing and and yeah, people are going to you know bag on it and say, "Oh, it's not good writing." It's like, well, what do you know? Uh, just say it's not to my taste and, and go, you know, go on about your business. Don't sit there and harp on it like you actually have uh, an objective uh, opinion about this stuff because it's all subjective. And with subjective, you're never going to get agreement. It's just not going to happen. You were attacked personally and viciously. How exactly do you deal with people who are so divorced from reality that they call your 20 plus year marriage to your wife a shield? that you were just using to deflect charges of racism. Well, that you know, that that came from Arthur Chu specifically, who these days is is mostly a controversial pundit on all things regarding race, gender, what have you. You know, when when he came after me, he didn't care about me. My wife uh, is very cynical about social media. She's not on social media. And one of the reasons she's not on social media is cuz she's tired of the way social media enables people to to be rude to each other uh, without consequences, without having to look someone in the eye. You know, if Arthur and I were standing face to face, would he have the guts to say what he said online? I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> e e e either way, I just kind of have to, you know, look at that and say, "That's oh, come on, man, really." Uh, you know, the the absurdity of it. Uh, well, honest, there's I could unpack a whole giant uh, long thing about how this is all playing out anyway, because. Uh, you know, when Arthur does what he does, and when accusations like this are leveled, yeah, they're infuriating. Uh, yeah, they, they 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 will absolutely piss me off um, in the in the moment. Uh, but usually, I have to just step back and look at the larger political picture and what's going on. And and right now, I think everybody is aware of the fact that I our society, the, you know, the American twenty first century society, is having kind of a a spasm or a paroxysm, if you want to call it. You know, people are inventing all kinds of reasons to be pissed off and claiming uh, victimhood right and left, and demanding this and demanding that, and accusations, and and it's like a it's like a whirlwind of nastiness. Uh, and to me, Arthur is is part of that, and his uh, his uh, his accusation was all part of that. I, I, to me, it's it's been a big, huge turnoff seeing it happen because uh, I, I don't think it accomplishes anything good. I think it makes matters worse. I th you know, when someone like Arthur does that to someone like me, because here's Here's the thing. I, I am on Arthur's side, whether he likes it or not. Uh, I think I think that's the thing that people like Arthur probably don't really realize is that you know a lot of people that they make these accusations against, we're on their side whether they like it or not. Um, it, it's stupid for them to come and try to kick us in the shins. I don't know what that accomplishes. I certainly don't think it convinces anybody that is approaching it from a, a standpoint of uh, of examining the the evidence. 
but then again, most of the people that are uh, on Arthur's Twitter feed that are following him rabidly, they're not interested in evidence. It's all about name calling and it's all about virtue signaling and it's all about uh, getting up on a pedestal and, and being holier than thou. You know, it's 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 a strange kind of uh, zealotry, uh, in my opinion. You know, uh, regardless of how worthy the cause might be, you know, people who become zealots often become their own worst enemy. And I, I think that's very true for Arthur and, and anyone else that's parroted these kind of uh, accusations and they and they did it all summer long and they had a lot of help uh but that's because you know the media is tuned to this kind of thing but i think uh, you know the, the the populace the uh the the total sum of people who hear and read these uh, accusations is much much wider than the people who make those accusations realize you know people are smart people can think for themselves uh, i think uh, americans especially are becoming very savvy about spotting this stuff when when it happens um, so in a strange sort of way, yeah, uh, uh, you know, when Arthur, you know, does stuff like that, it's infuriating. But at the same time, you know, uh, it sends a double message. It, 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 yeah, he's broadcasting it to his side and they eat it up with a fork and a spoon. But at the same time, people who are tired of these accusations, and I don't just mean sad puppies, I mean in general, people who are tired of the uh, the victim, what do, you, what do you want to call it, uh, cry bullies. I've seen that word used often lately cry bullies you know people are tired of the cry bullies they're tired of people who cry and whine about victimhood and they're they're on the attack all the time so you know i think sad puppies actually ended up getting an enormous amount of what i would call uh, underground uh, support for this very reason because all this uh, stupidity uh, manifested very quickly beginning in april and the whole time they were screaming and shouting at us i don't think they realized that they were broadcasting a double message and that double message uh, was was really heard, in my opinion, very loudly by a lot of people, some of whom weren't even interested in sad puppies to begin with, but because they're so tired of this cry bully stuff, uh, they're so tired of the of of the victim mongering, and 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 the the endless cries of racism, sexism, homophobia, blah 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 blah. You know, it just it becomes a a, a drone after a while. The people who are tired of that stuff came over to the sad puppies uh, viewpoint uh, even if they they didn't know anything about it to begin with uh, very often I, I got lots of messages lots of emails uh, even from people in some surprising places within science fiction proper who all said wow you know this is crazy I can't believe they're calling you this this is stupid uh, you know I was on the fence before but now I'm on your side because this is out of control and it's 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 people being completely idiotic and so on and so forth so all those kinds of messages that were being sent to me and they weren't just sent to me I know uh, others were getting them as well um, told me that we were definitely uh, on the right track um, we had opened a can of worms that probably needed to be opened a long time ago uh, we had peeled the tinfoil off the rotten TV dinner <laughs> and uh, we were airing things out that needed to be aired out so what do you mean when you say that you're on the same side as Arthur whether he likes it or not well, you know, because again, Arthur, uh, at least if I read his rhetoric, is, you know, he's claiming to do this uh, for the sake of equality, you know. And uh, I don't think someone like Arthur, at least again, to read his rhetoric and his, uh, his bombast, uh, realizes that many of the people he accuses are, are, are fully in favor of equality, too. Uh, certainly nobody uh, that was involved in Sad Puppies 3 or 2 or 1 Larry, Sarah Hoyt, you know, it, 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 to me it goes without saying that all of us in that group are for equality. Uh, you know, that, to, to us, to have somebody accuse us of being against that is, uh, is rather ludicrous. Uh, so, you know, Arthur can try to shove us uh, out of the, uh, the good guy circle, but we're still in the good guy circle whether he likes it or not. And uh, to me, that's one of the big differences between us and them is, uh, you know, with all this talk about diversity, being diverse means you have to have room in your mind and in your soul for the fact that there are people other than you and they think different things and they have different opinions and just because they think different things and have different opinions that doesn't make them bad <laughs> I think that's the, one of the chief breakdowns of the cry bullies and I definitely would call Arthur a cry bully at this point you know uh, to him diversity is 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 a strange kind of skin deep flag that he waves but what he ends up demanding, because he's so aggressive and calls people names and is, is very belligerent, is he ends up enforcing or trying to enforce a, a kind of monoculture uh, where everybody on, on quotes his wavelength 
in quotes, uh, thinks the same, has the same outlook and ideology. It, it, you know, it's a little bit like if you were to take a soccer field filled with people and split a line down the middle, and one side uh, does nothing but uh, scream and shout and point fingers at itself until all those people have been divorced to the other side. And so one side of the field is virtually empty and it's populated by a very few angry, unhappy, uh, caustic individuals who have divorced and shoved off everyone else onto the other side. Uh, so they've, you know, in their minds, they've won. But to me, they've lost because they haven't reached anybody. All they've done is turn people off, send people to the other side. I don't think it helps, uh, you know, if we're talking about questions of racism or, or whatever, I don't think it helps at all. I think it makes it worse, frankly. You know, when I look at Arthur Chu's rhetoric uh, or any of the rhetoric that's uh, thrown out by the cry bullies, I, I think about, um, you know, Martin Luther King Jr., in my opinion, uh, kind of set the bar in terms of uh, of, of the sentiment that is uh, that is worthy. And, you know, for him, it was all about content of character, not, you know, what we look on the like on the outside, not the superficial packaging, but it's who we are on the inside, you know, your your integrity, your your morals, your your work ethic, uh, you know, that was the message I think King uh, won with, you know, uh, he, uh, I, I think that's how he won people over. Uh, because that's a message, in my opinion, that resonates universally. You know, it's a, it's it's about who you are on the inside, what your heart is made of, not what's between your legs, not what you look like, uh, not who you sleep with. You know, those things are external. So when we're talking about, about you know fighting for equality, if you can't get on the same page as Martin Luther King, I think you're missing the point. Well, speaking of diversity, does it call into question the motives of others when they scream diversity while voting against a Jewish single mother simply because a white Mormon guy suggested she was a good choice? <laughs> yes, I, I, I think uh, I think the the activities of the individuals who made it their business to oppose sad puppies um, were were, were a patently anti-diverse. Really, they made a mockery of the whole thing in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, they, they screamed at us and said we were anti-diversity, and yet our, our suggestion list was very diverse, both in terms of the outer factors, you know, gender or, or, or whatever, but also in terms of the, the inner factors, you know, people's ideologies and, and what kind of uh, writing they did. So to me, it was like, whatever, you know, do you guys even know what diversity means? Do you know what that word means? I don't think you're getting it. And then, of course, you know, they said, well, you know, block votes are bad. And then, of course, in August, you know, they engaged in the greatest block vote uh, in Hugo history. <laughs> yeah. Through this whole thing, um, what it seemed like to me is is we were dealing with people who would scream and shout at you from a certain principled standpoint, and then and then they would stampede right over the top of those principles in order to try to win. And to me, that was extremely disappointing. With the editor choices, especially this year, I was hugely disappointed um, because to me, the editor choices, yeah, I could kind of get it with the writing. Uh, because again, writing is subjective, and hey, maybe a majority of people really didn't like uh, the stuff that was on the final ballot. I mean, shoot, even the story that did win, uh, Thomas, uh, uh, I don't know, how, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, uh, Ode Ode Halt or Ode the Halt. I I'm mangling his last name, and I apologize for that. You know, he he almost didn't win a trophy either because I think I think uh, three or four rounds of no award was ranked above him until like the final the final wash, and then he squeaked in. So. Uh, but on the editors, to me, these were these were almost bulletproof. Um, I, I really can't think of anybody uh, who is a worthwhile person in the genre who who wouldn't say that Tony Weisskopf and Mike Resnick aren't extremely worthy, deserving people. You know, Tony and Mike, uh, in their roles as editors, short fiction and long fiction, have labored for many, many years on many, many different projects, and, and every year they do good work, and it's it's out there for everyone to see. You know, uh, Mike most recently is editing, you know, Galaxy's Edge, and he's doing these issues, which actually contain a, a tremendous amount of new and old fiction, and all of it's very, very good. You know, Mike is 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 a very savvy guy, and definitely knows his uh, knows his stuff, and the same with Tony. You know, uh, how many uh, how many careers have been birthed? Uh, from both of those people. Uh, you know, it's the same argument like with Stan Schmidt when he was editing Analog, you know. Stan finally got a Hugo, but he had to frickin' retire to get one. Uh, you know, to me, no editor should have to retire uh, in order for the, the the Hugos to throw the guy a bone, you know. 
Stan probably should have won at least a dozen or more for uh, the time he was at Analog and again all the careers he birthed including mine to me the editor categories uh, you know short f uh, form and full length you know Tony Weisskopf and Mike Resnick were in for both of those and uh, to me those were the most harmless I, I really don't understand how anybody could have had a problem with uh, either one of those uh, as a top pick and in fact in my opinion uh, Tony did win uh, because Tony got more votes for best editor by far by a factor of at least five or six uh, than any prior winner before her. Uh, you know, the winners in the past tended to get maybe uh, a couple hundred uh, first run uh, votes as the top pick. Uh, the, the top editor tends to be the, the one who gets the most top uh, 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 votes, uh, first run votes. Well, Tony got over a thousand, uh, which is unheard of. Nobody's ever gotten even close to that many. Uh, and, and yet she still lost to the block vote. Um, those of us who were watching uh, identified a 2,500 person, uh, more or less a block vote that just kind of en masse uh, said no to everything that was connected to our suggestion list. Again, in complete violation of the stated principles of the plaintiffs who had been complaining all summer long that block votes are bad. And so they, of course, launch uh, the greatest block vote in Huger history and, and totally trashed it, uh, set it on fire and burn it to the ground, in my opinion. Which, again, what does that prove about diversity? Uh, how do you prove you're diverse uh, by completely trashing people uh, who are not only worthy and deserving, but uh, it just makes no sense to me whatsoever. I, I kind of am still at a loss for words at the, uh, uh, the mindset of the individuals who decided that that was the way they were going to, quotes, protect the Hugo Award. Uh, uh, really, the, uh, here's the irony. Uh, way back in April, the infamous Vox Day, uh, who sends everyone scurrying to go hide under their beds, uh, had basically told, and he really does, I mean, Vox Day, like, is is the boogeyman. He, he scares these people to death. Uh, they're terrified of the guy. Uh, they run screaming anytime his name is invoked. Uh, anyway, so, you know, he, he gets on there and says, well, if you guys nuke it uh, this year, I'm sure as hell going to nuke it next year. And uh, it's like playing chicken with, uh, I think I compared it on my blog to the Kurgan from uh, the Highlander movies. I mean, this is the Kurgan's favorite game is playing chicken. You idiots, you're playing chicken with the Kurgan. Well, they decided to play chicken with the Kurgan uh, and they blew it up. And so I don't know what's going to happen uh, in 2016. Uh, uh, you know, <laughs> it might be chicken all over again. Um, and, and really, what I, I foresee an end game coming out of all this, and it's not good for the Hugos. Uh, basically, what uh, the establishment is going to do is they're going to keep inventing new rules or changes to the rules to the point that only a, uh, a vetted body of people are going to be allowed to vote on the Hugos. Um, so it's basically going to be a quasi, in my opinion, it will inevitably come out to be a kind of a quasi panel, so to speak because only the correct people are going to be allowed to have a vote uh, and all the rest of us dirty uh, scum uh, are going to be uh, locked out of it permanently and at that point to me the Hugo is, is literally going to become meaningless it's, it's uh, prestige has been waning for a long time, it's relevance has been waning for a long time uh, but I think that's what's going to kill it right there is because the people who uh, claim to be for diversity uh, continually seem to have a knack for proving that they're against diversity and they are so against diversity that they will lock out um, all the people that they don't want until there literally is nobody left but just them uh, which in their world that's a, that's a win you know they cheered back in August uh, when they burnt the thing down uh, not realizing I think uh, that they were doing exactly what Vox Day dum 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 wanted them to do uh, I, you know, I think he <laughs> he played them like a fiddle, uh, and they cheered while they did it. And wow, okay, great! What a resounding uh, statement of love for science fiction when you have to burn the whole thing down uh, to keep people out that you think are bad, uh, who just want to have a say. You know, really, that that's that's the part of, uh, to me that is um, is mind bending. Is that this all began way back at the start with just. You know, let's let's have more people have a say in this thing. And apparently, having more people have a say was the worst thing ever. It, it, it sent people into fits of rage uh, that w the wrong people were going to come in now and vote on the Hugo for a, a a group of individuals who pride themselves apparently 
on being diverse. You know, there's that there's that word that's that ho the holy word is diversity, which they aren't really. Uh, you know, that's the other thing Michael Z. Williamson points out all the time. If you look at a photo of uh, who the winners are uh, from year to year, uh, <laughs> it's a bunch of uh, mostly older, uh, completely white people. Again, all with the same general politics and outlook on the world. There's almost no diversity to it. And then they just go and slam the door in people's faces like they did this year, and it becomes even less diverse. And like ultimately, it will kill the Hugo. Uh, it will have zero relevance. I mean, it's kind of almost there anyway, but it's it will definitely happen then because they will keep, again, changing the rules uh, uh, to, to lock people out until it's it's this quasi-judged thing where a, a quorum or a board or whatever you want to call it uh, makes the calls on, on either the wards directly themselves or on who gets to vote. Uh, so either way, it'll 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 ensure that the right people win. You know, it'll be a classic, completely rigged thing. The right people will win every time, uh, or the, the or the people from the right group will win every time, and all the dirty, nasty, uh, evil people from the real world will be kept out, uh, which apparently is is the way some people think fandom should be. It's the cool kids club. Only in this case, the cool kids club is composed of people who never got to be in the cool kids club, and so they've invented this this rejects club for themselves um, and and the way that they prove <laughs> their coolness is to is to try to keep the club pure uh, over at Steve Davidson's blog uh, amazing stories you know that's that's his whole thing is we've got to keep fandom pure we've got to but only the only the true fans are you know should be allowed to be part of this sacred institution and it's it's all very uh, dire and serious and I think they've lost the point you know isn't this supposed to be about fun Aren't we supposed to be enjoying ourselves? Uh, the joy completely ran out of this thing this year. Uh, <laughs> and it big hurt, and it was doing it. They were the ones uh, throwing it all overboard. Uh, it was amazing to watch it happen so quickly. And of course, they dragged in all the external media and uh, made it into just a complete clown show. In my opinion, it was extremely embarrassing for the genre because it was unnecessary and it was uh, hyper reactive. And it was uh, very, uh, again, like I said, they ran roughshod over their own stated principles on numerous occasions and didn't seem to care. Um, it was uh, it was just silly. So can this Hugo thing be salvaged, and should we even try? Um, you know, uh, I noticed um, over on uh, Arlen Andrews' uh, webpage, uh, or not his webpage, his Facebook page, um, something interesting has happened uh, just like in the last few days. Uh, because that that question's come up before. Are the Hugos worth salvaging? Uh, you know, what should we do about it? Um, uh, back uh, at the at the tail end of the Hugo brouhaha on Hugo night, you know, of course, uh, uh, one of the primary uh, critics, um, George R. R. Martin, had his little cool kids party in the mansion, um, and where he handed out the hood ornaments, the Alfies, he called them for uh, Alfred Bester. Well, somebody um, has sent out uh, what appear to be like a glass globe or uh, a swirly. It, it looks very much like, I agree with Mike Rezik, it looks like the nebula. Uh, and it's called the Jovian. So, and it, from what I can see on the website, this is this is somebody new. This, is, this appears to be a group of fans, not uh, sad puppies, not the puppy haters. This is somebody different. And, and so they're running th this new thing, which I think is fascinating. Maybe they've got the right idea. Maybe it just needs to go back to being just fans, uh, you know, trying to pick people for providing enjoyment. Um, the Hugos, I, I don't know. I think at this point they might be dead. Um, they might be so thoroughly poisoned and politicized that they're gone. Uh, again, I, I think in, in the in the bigger realm of the consumer market, the consumer consensus is that having the word Hugo or Nebula uh, or Clark Award or you know, there's there's dozens and dozens of science fiction awards having these things on your book cover doesn't impact sales uh, that was one of the dirty secrets I discovered way back in uh, 2012 uh, when I was the triple nominee for the Hugo and the Nebula and the Campbell I, at that time I was totally excited to me this was a huge deal you know these are these are big these are these are big things in science fiction or so I thought uh, and so I ran off and talked to some editors and agents and was all excited and to the last, they all kind of quietly admitted to me, you know, to be honest, these aren't really important to us on the end of the market where the business happens because they're not really indicators of how well you'll sell. 
putting them on your book cover does change how well the books sell. Speaking anecdotally, you know, people say you shouldn't do that, but I've heard from any number of readers that they actually avoid books now that have Hugo winner or Hugo nominee on the cover because they've been burned too many times in the past. They've read something that has, you know, a lot of fancy awards on it or whatever, and it ends up being something that they don't like. And I think that's happened to enough people often enough that those uh, earmarks have actually started to have a negative stigma. And I, I think it all, again, points back to the fact that the award certainly the the nebula has been like this for a while but the hugo is now too you know hopelessly politicized it's it's being awarded for all kinds of reasons other than is the is the book or the story generally broadly enjoyed by people uh, you know once in a while they'll 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 sync it up right but those are more accidents than they are deliberate uh, very often the, the hugo and the nebula especially go to things that are very obscure uh, very academic um, very politically uh, uh, topical, you know. Again, um, lately it's a, it's all about the 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 social justice thing. So, books have to be relevant in terms of social justice, and it doesn't matter if the book is actually entertaining or if the story is entertaining. <laughs> if it's relevant, oh, then it's award worthy because it's relevant. And I, to me, that uh, audiences don't care about that. They, I, I think, in the main, people just don't care. They they do not care. They want to be entertained. They want to be taken on a journey. The politics of it, even if the politics synchronize with their own, I think people get annoyed if it's too obvious. R really, my deepest concern beyond the Hugos, because to me the Hugos are just a, a, a canary in the coal mine. My my deeper concern is that science fiction as a genre, as a as a enterprise in which I am now gainfully employed, making money, uh, is is literally going to go into its own belly button and disappear from the popular market it's at least in, in written form you know on, on the big screen they still get it you know Star Wars is out now the seventh movie and apparently it's it's everyone's loving it I see nothing but praise for it I, I have no doubt that it's gonna go on to earn what past a billion dollars you know the, the 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 movie theater people they get it but the prose people I think are, are more and more fascinated with turning science fiction into an academic uh, arena only, where it's it's very self-referential, it's very very dense and difficult for people on the outside to to come in and, and get it and and even know what the heck people are talking about. Again, it's it, it's lately especially it's become uh, hyper focused on issues of race and gender and whatnot. And I, I'm not saying you can't have those in your in your book or your story, but uh, when those are the primary things that get trotted out as the reason to read the story, not, hey, this was a great story, this was amazing, I, I loved it, but this is a socially conscious story, and this is, this, is, this is very aware of the problems in our society at this time, you know, when it is delivered like a sermon, like a spoonful of castor oil, uh, that's where I think that the chief problem lies, because who likes castor oil? Yeah, seriously. Yeah, and if, if people learn that science fiction in written form is nothing but castor oil, as I think a lot of readers have over the past 20 years, you know, that's the other thing. I've gotten so much mail, so much mail um, from older readers, and not necessarily older meaning uh, physically old, but people who have been reading since they were teenagers, who said, yeah, I used to read it all the time, and I, I drifted away. And the reason I drifted away is because it just wasn't doing anything for me anymore. Either they were tired of being given a political sermon of some kind or it, the stories just weren't wowing them the way they used to. Uh, they just felt like the, the genre had missed the mark too many times. And I, it, to me, that's that's going to eliminate the genre from uh, from the shelves uh, sooner or later. You know, the market wins every time. <laughs> and, and, and if people aren't buying the books, people aren't buying the books. And if the books aren't getting bought, the publishers uh, will go away. And ultimately, uh, self-publishing might have to be the thing that saves science fiction, to be honest. You know, books like Andy Weir's The Martian, you know, that was a massive hit, um, which was completely ignored by the Hugos until the very last minute, I might add. Nobody cared about that book when it was first published. They only cared about it when it suddenly went big. Uh, again, it was a very 11th hour, 59th minute bandwagon thing. But you know, self-publishing uh, might rescue it. Uh, but by that point, if it really comes to that point where, you know, none of the big publishers exist anymore, and, and it's not even being sold on the shelves anymore. Uh, the Hugo will be long gone. The, the Worldcon might still be happening. They might still be giving the award out, but nobody outside the little tiny it, it, itty bitty world of uh, World Science Fiction Society will even recognize what it is or care. 
And I know that's <laughs> I uncorked a whole <laughs> big. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, what do you care? As long as you keep that ugly thing off my book and don't let anybody know that you even considered me for it and wreck my sales. I, I you know, I, I, I told, uh, you know, Wordfire Press publishes my short fiction collections. And uh, up till now, I've had uh, in, in kind of gold foil at the bottom, you know, Hugo nominee and, and award nominee and all this stuff. Frankly, I'm probably considering taking that off um, because I, I, I have yet to meet a single reader who said, yes, I bought this book because it had that on it. Now, I have had people buy it who saw, you know, the quote at the top from Stan Schmidt uh, comparing me to Robert Heinlein. That has sold books. But having, you know, Hugo nominee, uh, Nebula nominee, you know, Hugo, these things haven't, as, as far as I know, haven't sold me very many books at all. Um, so I'm considering just dropping it, to be honest. Yeah. Um, certainly, certainly, it hasn't been an essential component for somebody like Larry Correa. No. Uh, to me, Larry is a, is a perfect example of, of how you can do extremely well, uh, and 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 it it, it you know <laughs> it never mattered. Uh, again, uh, the Hugo lately uh, seems to be one of those things that is given almost as a as a counter statement to somebody's popularity. I remember uh, two years ago. When um, the Wheel of Time series wound up on the on the ballot for best novel, and people booed, I, I remember watching that uh, live uh, when they had the announcements. Uh, people booed the Wheel of Time, and I just slapped my forehead. Uh, uh, oh my gosh, you know, there it is again. You have this enormously popular, very successful series, and they're booing it. Ooh, you know, and I thought, oh, there, there's the disconnect in a nutshell, right there. How many fans have have come into reading science fiction and fantasy through Robert Jordan's books, or in this case, you know, Brandon Sanderson? You know, how many how many millions of fans uh, have come into the genre reading this stuff as their entry port, and we're booing it? Ooh, it's bad. Ooh, it's it's not worthy of our sacred award. And I was like, oh come on, guys, really? Do we have to be that stupid about it? Do we have to be <laughs> that dumb? Um, it, apparently, we do because it, it, we went full derp this year they just derp right off the cliff uh and cheered on the way uh i don't know what's going to happen this year in 2016 i have no idea <laughs> really don't so what's the biggest thing you learned running sad puppies 3 you know i, I put up a, a blog post uh just kind of lessons learned from someone who who ended up being an amateur politician without really realizing it uh, going in the biggest thing well I, I learned several things um so so people who are determined to not like you uh, meaning people who are determined to have a problem with you, uh, no matter what you do, no matter what you say, they will set up the goalposts. It's kind of like Lucy in the football with Charlie Brown. You know, they'll put the football, oh, come on, Charlie Brown, kick the football, and you'll go to kick the football, and she'll take it away, and you'll land on your back. I learned that lesson uh, very quickly. Uh, that no matter what I did, Lucy was always going to pull the ball away, so I kind of stopped uh, trying to kick the ball. Um, some of the other things I learned was that, yeah, uh, you know, and this 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 was the one that hurt. Uh, is is that some people who uh, s you would swear they're your friends, uh, and you would swear that they're solid, end up not being that solid when the heat comes. Uh, you know, you find out who your friendships of convenience are to the extent that sometimes people will who are your friends will end up not only not being your friends, but they'll stick a knife in uh, when when they think it's 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 time to do it, and so. You know that that was hard. That happened a, at least a couple times. I've, you know, I've had to just you know, lick my wounds and, and move on. Um, but on the flip side, you know, at the same time, you also find out who uh, the class acts are, uh, who the people uh, who are worth it are, um, and that's definitely been true. Uh, and, and in some ways, it's been surprising who has come out of the word work uh, to to express support. Um, some of it's been from people I haven't uh, had a lot of interaction with, but apparently they. They came out in the end and they said, you know what, all the bad stuff that got said, uh, you know, I, I thought it was total crap and you didn't deserve to get treated like that and nobody else who was uh, nominated deserved to get treated like that. But to me, that's an important one um, right there. Uh, you know, we had a lot of people who were on our uh, initial suggestion list that ended up on the final ballot and and everyone got burned to the ground. Uh, it was, you know, they had, they had to burn the village to save the village and they sure did. <laughs> uh, so I was, I, and then, frankly, that surprised me in a bad way. You know, again, there's this 2,500 person block uh, at its root. 2,500 people uh, were willing to 
uh, throw everything and everyone under the bus in order to have their way. Uh, and to me, that was a, a spectacularly selfish, short-sighted, unfan-like, in my opinion, uh, thing to do. Because again, supposedly, both the Worldcon and the Hugo were supposed to be about celebrating, you know, this beautiful, wonderful, amazing thing we call science fiction in all its forms. And then to see something like that happen, it became obvious, at least to me, that for those 2,500 individuals, it had nothing to do with celebrating science fiction. It had to do with exercising control. And it had to do with uh, controlling the, the totem, so to speak. Uh, I put up a big uh, post about tribalism and how tribal this whole thing got. You know, uh, again, they had to burn the village to save the village uh, from the evil invaders uh, who just wanted to have a space at the table. That was that was the bottom line is, you know, I, I think everybody that supported Sad Puppies uh, just wanted to have a little bit of representation on that ballot because there were plenty of authors and there continue to be plenty of authors and editors and artists and other individuals who are all doing amazing work in this field and they're just never on the Hugo radar ever. Uh, and uh, the only way they can get there is if people who uh, are fans of their work, you know, put their two cents in. But of course, now I'm 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 almost certain that the uh, the establishment is going to uh, lock the doors, throw down the gates, and they're gonna they're gonna seal themselves off eventually. It might not happen immediately this year. It might take four or five years, but I think eventually they're gonna go there. They're just not going to allow anyone to come in and change the equation to the extent that Sad Puppies Three changed the equation. Thank you, Brad. I appreciate you spending some time with us. Any final words for the listeners? Um, thank you for listening. Uh, I appreciate people taking time out of their busy uh, schedules to listen to me blather on. Yes, I, the novel The Chaplain's War has been out uh, now from Bain Books for over a year. Uh, it's now out in mass market paperback. That's the paperbacks I grew up with and love dearly. Uh, and it's out in stores now. Uh, also available online uh, through Audible, uh, Amazon, uh, ebook, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm also contracted uh, uh, through Bain Books to do more fiction, so I have more on the way. Probably will be hitting print in 2017. Otherwise, I always have uh, pieces of short work uh, popping up all the time in different venues. Uh, so you can always uh, go to my blog or uh, uh, find me in the pages of Analog Magazine. Thanks a lot, Brad. I appreciate it. You can find more from Brad Torgerson at bradrtorgerson.wordpress.com. That's Brad R T O R G E R S E N dot com. A link to Brad's website and to his Amazon author page is in the show notes. And that was a lot of information, and rather than make the podcast any longer than it already is, we're just going to jump straight into the book review. So this week's book was actually a novella, The Builders. By Daniel Polanski, $3 on Amazon. A Missing Eye, A Broken Wing, A Stolen Country, The Last Job Didn't End Well. Years go by and scars fade, but memories only fester. For the animals of the captain's company, survival has meant keeping a low profile, building a new life, and trying to forget the war they lost. But now the captain's whiskers are twitching at the idea of evening the score. <laughs> Yours is much better than the audio we listened to. <laughs> <laughs> we did. We uh, I played the I played the uh, the the audio on you know sample the audio and I thought that's just the wrong voice for this because I, I I read a little bit of the book mm-hmm. and I'm like no 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 that's just way 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 too light and happy. It wasn't right. <laughs> it just, it just, so I never did buy the audio. I, I read it and I kept reading it to myself because it was just this incredibly dark story. And then there was just these parts of it that were like, oh, it's all happy. And then it's like, oh my goodness, it's so dark. <laughs> <laughs> I really wanted to make it funnier than it was. <laughs> it just, I wanted it to be full of whimsy and because. It was like it was like kind of like an episode of Happy Tree Friends, <laughs> which I know you're not familiar with, but now you have to go watch it on YouTube. <laughs> yeah, the characters just had me rolling at times because yeah. there were these completely different characters. Now, see, they weren't human; they were different kinds of animals. Mm-hmm. 
And you, now, I, of course, I'm not familiar with Happy Tree Friends, but you're not familiar with Apocalypse Meow, are you? No, I'm not. <laughs> now, and I'm going to call it Apocalypse Meow because that's the polite name that they call it in the United States. There's a different name for it that most people know it as, the Japanese name for it, that I can't use on a family-friendly podcast. Uh, there's a link to it. If, you know, Google Apocalypse Meow, they'll give you the name that most people know it under. But... Uh, <laughs> It's these anthropomorphic animals, and uh, they're fighting war. Well, this is a Western, and it's a dark, dark Western. And it's, <laughs> it's, it's a Western, it's like a fantasy Western, this book here. And it is incredibly cool. One of the characters is Bonsoir. And I've, I really got to read some of this because it's just hilarious. Bonsoir was a stoat. And that's the first thing that needs to be said. There are many animals that are like stoats, similar enough in purpose and design as to confuse the amateur naturalist. Weasels, for instance, and ferrets. But Bonsoir was a stoat. And as far as he was concerned, a stoat was as distinct from its cousins as the sun is from the moon. To mistake him for a weasel or, heaven forbid, a polecat, well, let's just say that creatures who voiced that misimpression tended not to do so ever again. Creatures who voiced that misimpression tended, generally speaking, not to do anything ever again. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it's just hilarious. And then it's not. Yeah. Really, really not. But I kept laughing at it because it was just, it was almost comical how dark it, it was almost funny how dark it was. They're two fuzzy animals. <laughs> and yes, it was really, really well done. The guy is a good writer and he, and he takes you up and down and up and down. It's the classic thing where you see where this, where you build a team of disparate characters mm -hmm. and, you know, you flash back scene to scene where you go, you know, everybody gathers in a bar, but, you know, here, here you're in the bar, you've introduced two characters. And then the next character is going to walk in, but you've got to introduce the character. So you flash back to the scene where the character meets one of the two characters, mm -hmm. right? And then he walks into the bar and meets the group. And then you flash back to another scene, and then that's that character. And then he comes into the bar. And it's this... Very, very, very classic movie sequence. Kind of like The Hobbit. <laughs> Could be that. But it's it's a very classic Western sequence. Yeah. I want to see this turned into a movie. And honestly, I don't care if they do, if they just change them all into human beings and turn it into a live action movie. Or if they go Apocalypse Meow and make it animation and retain all the animals. I don't care what they do. It would be awesome. It needs to be a movie. It is really super cool. The story is basically, without giving too much away here, the captain is a mouse, and he's the littlest one of the bunch, but like he's he's a badass. The mouse is the leader, the captain, you know, he's gathering his team together from a failed war where he was double crossed. He was the captain who fought for one of the frogs, who was the eldest brother of two frogs who were the sons of the king frog. The king frog was going to separate his kingdom into two kingdoms, and the two sons were going to take over half the kingdom. And of course, you know, like in every sword and sorcery fantasy ever, the two brothers can't possibly take half a kingdom each. Oh no, they've got to fight over it. Of course, it's not a sword and sorcery <laughs> epic. It's a Western. So it's not swords and, and, and magic. It's shotguns and six shooters and sniper rifles yeah and and they fight over it and there's a big double cross and the captain who was almost on the verge of winning gets double crossed and his side loses and they're not really sure who's responsible for the double cross and he puts his team back together and now he's you know many years later gonna try to get his revenge and that's what's going on it was awesome <laughs> it's really cool. It is a Western, but it's a super dark, really super dark Western. So it really does live up to the grim dark label. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, absolutely. And if you have even the slightest interest in Westerns, like really well done Westerns, it's the book, man. It is. 
I don't know what modern westerns are like, but any of the old school westerns, you know, boom, it's one of those. It's really awesome. So, and especially it's three bucks. Oh yeah, you spend can't spend the wrong. three bucks. Get yourself a Kindle if you don't have one. Spend the three bucks. This is a great story. Do not read it to your kids. <laughs> <laughs> yes, not a kid book. <laughs> not kid friendly. Way too dark. Read it to yourself. Try not to read it to yourself in the dark. But yeah, it's uh, it's pretty good. There are parts you will want to read out loud, though. The bonsoir parts, especially oh, if wow. you can do a passable <laughs> French accent. Yeah. They kind of reminded me of the 18. <laughs> yeah, but not not as funny. Not as funny, but I they they did kind of remind me of the 18. I don't know why, but... It's the same sort of group of people who are very, very different. It's a very classic yeah. uh, American movie thing where you get people who are very, very, very different. Yeah. And everybody has their own little thing, but they don't but necessarily misfit. like each other. Yeah. Kind of a misfit kind of crew of misfits. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's some definite people who don't like each other and people who do like each other a lot. Yeah kind of three musketeers kind of dirty dozen yeah i loved it it was really good and this would make a fantastic movie and honestly god i don't care how they do it i i I don't care if they turn it into human beings and do it that way or if they it has to be animals it has to be animals it has to be animals if they manage to do it with animals the problem is 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 whenever you animate something everybody thinks it's got to be for kids and there's no way you could do this for kids no like like Babe, the pig movie. Babe, the first movie was great for kids. But Babe 2, Pig in the City, was not a movie for children. It was a movie for adults. Yeah. But it has to be animals. Right. It was great. Read this book. Spend the $3. You will not regret it. It was a great book. That book, again, was The Builders by Daniel Polanski. $3 on Amazon. And the link is in the show notes. The Wrong Phone Podcast runs on your donations. We count on you to donate or subscribe to cover our server costs and our book and equipment expenses. Making a podcast is a lot of fun, but it's not cheap. Please consider making a donation or subscribing. Go to wrongfun.com and click on the PayPal link. You can make a one-time donation of any amount or subscribe for as little as $2 a month. That doesn't sound like much, but we pay our server costs monthly. It's a tiny amount from you, but it's a giant help to us. Thanks for joining us on this voyage. Music courtesy of Simplify Recordings. Send your feedback, both good and great, to feedback at wrongfun.com. Show notes can be found at wrongfun.com forward slash episode nine. The captain has locked onto the station and turned off the fasten safety restraint sign and you are free to move about the cabin. We hope you've enjoyed your journey with us on the Wrong Fun Podcast. Don't forget to like and share the Wrong Fun Podcast on Facebook. And if you've booked your travel today through iTunes, make sure to leave us a glowing five-star review. And remember, this show is powered entirely by your donations. See our website at wrongfun.com for details. This is a URS production. Random Noise.